good morning and welcome to Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for January 9th, 2022. And this is Sister Sharon. We are on our winter quarter, Justice, Law and History. This comes from the Uniform Series for the International Bible Lessons for Christian Teaching, the Discovery Adult Bible Studies, published quarterly by Urban Ministries Incorporated. We're on unit two, which is the source of justice. Our lesson today is Hagar and Ishmael not forgotten. Our key verse comes from Genesis 21 verses 17 and 18. And it says, and God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you Hagar? Fear not for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Again, that's Genesis 21, verses 17 and 18. Our lesson scripture comes from Genesis chapter 21, verses eight through 20. We have a lot of background to do, so you'll understand that um, what's going on in our lesson. So we start off with that we're in the book of Genesis and the name Genesis, the name means origin. Okay. And so written by Moses, as well as the other four books in the Pentateuch. So we think about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay. It covers more history than the rest of the Bible as it starts in the beginning. And if you look at Genesis 1, 1, it says in the beginning, God, and that's what's called that's who was here in the beginning, but it starts in the beginning and it goes until the death of Joseph in Egypt about 1800 BC. A main character today is going to be Hagar and Hagar, her name means possibly means flight. She was an Egyptian handmaiden. Some um, versions of the Bible call her a slave. Some call her a servant, um, but she was a, she was younger and, um, and so we do know that. And we also know again, so she was a childbearing age and she was um, Egyptian. Um, she was Abraham's concubine. And we'll talk more about that. She was, she was the mother of Abraham's first son, Ishmael. And she was known for being the woman Abraham's wife, Sarah, used as a surrogate to attempt to fulfill God's promise of a son. The other main character today is Ishmael. And Ishmael, his name might mean, and I put it, didn't put it down, but I found that his name might actually mean war. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so he's the son of Abraham and Hagar. He was the perceived competitor to Isaac. And Isaac is the son of promise. And later in life, he had an Egyptian wife, 12 sons and one daughter. So now still more background. So we have to do a lot of background scripture. So we're going to start off with our background scripture. I'm going to start off with Genesis um, chapter 15, verses one through six, because God made a covenant with Abram. And at this time, he was still Abram. God had not changed his name to Abraham yet. So then after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So um, biblically, or in these days, um, they needed a son. And Abraham and Sarah had had, Abram and Sarai at the time had not had any children. And so that meant whoever was, um, the heir was gonna be from his servant, okay? And so that's well, why it would have been Eliezer of Damascus. And so he's saying, I haven't had any children, but Lord, you're telling me, um, that you're my shield and that you're my exceedingly great reward. So then going on in verse four, it says, behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed God. So God was telling him, no, your servant is not going to be, your servant that's not your child is not going to be your heir. I'm gonna give you an heir from your own body, okay? So this is when God made this covenant with Abram and he changed his name to Abraham, which means father basically of many nations. And he changed Sarai's name because her name was S-A-R-A-I. He changed her name to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. Okay, and so now 
going on, still more Bible lesson, we need to go into Genesis 16, verses 1 through 5. And I call this helping God out. Okay, so, you know, this promise was made. They were excited about it. And even though we're just going from chapter 15 to chapter 16, years have passed. So that's where this comes and says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, then Sarai Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went to Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai, then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So here it is. The promise was made 10 years ago. Nothing had happened. Okay. Sarai was still um, barren. So she still had not had any children. And so then she gets the bright idea. Let's help God out because, you know, God's got to keep his word and we don't want God to look like he's lying. And God is not a man that he should lie everybody. So if God makes a promise, he's going to keep it. But sometimes we get into that. Let's help God out. So Sarah got into this. Let's help God out. And culturally, this was something that they did. So you might say, you know, what's this? So this is like we would um, um, say it as a surrogate you know, um, these days, but the, this surrogate wasn't by just, you know, taking the necessary fluids and bringing them together. This was called that the man and whoever the surrogate was actually had to have intercourse. So Sarai, even like I said, she had borne no children. And in marriage, one of the main points traditionally for marriage was they were supposed to um, have children and not just children, they were supposed to have a boy Okay, and so that that boy could be the heir. And so since she did not have any children, um, there was a code back then, and I want to try to say this code right. It's called the Code of Hammurapi. Okay, and this code, okay, which was a cultural code, was what Sarah started following. Sarah I started following. She started saying, okay, by the code, I can give one of my maids to my husband you know, and then that child that she bears will become like my child. So that's what she did. Now, God didn't say, um, ask Sarah to, Sarah to help him out and God doesn't need help everybody. Okay. So she was trying to fulfill God's promise because she knew that um, Abraham had to, Abram at the time had to be the father, you know, but she's thinking, okay, Abram has to be the father, but I can use this other woman and she can be, um, she can replace me. OK, and um, but just replace me in this act. And so when the child is born, then there's the son and then the promise is fulfilled. Well, so here Abram does. He, it says, and Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now, if you think back to Genesis beginning all the way in the beginning, same issue before with Adam and Eve. OK, the serpent talked to Eve. OK, and then Adam did what Eve said. OK, and it wasn't what God said. OK, so we must obey God rather than man or woman. And so Abram heeded the voice of his wife. So then so Sarai went and took her Hagar, her maid. And it's assumed that Hagar is young. She's at least of childbearing age. We know that. So but they, she might actually been even a teenager, you know, and they gave her to her husband, Abram. So remember, um, he's older. And we'll talk about how old in a minute, but it had been 10 years that had passed, okay? And, um, and so he went to Hagar and she ended up having a son, okay? And then when she saw she had a son, she got up at him, okay? Because she was like, I was able to do something my mistress couldn't do. I was able to give this rich and powerful um, man of God, um, this master, a male child, first child, male child, you know what I mean? And so, so she started despising Sarah. So then Sarah said to um, Abram, my wrong be upon you. So then she got mad. So she could have got mad at the code of her of him or I'm going to say that really say that she could have got mad at that code. H-A-M-M-U-R-A. 
A-P-I. I think that's how you spell it. She could have got mad at the code. She could have got mad at herself for trying to help God out. But instead, she, she got mad at Abram. You know, it's like, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid to, you, to your embrace. And now that she's conceived, she's not treating me right. Okay. So the Lord, the Lord judged between you and me. So then Sarai started getting, um, Sarai started getting mean to Hagar. Now, this story talks about the, the plight of um, Hagar the second time, our actual lesson. But actually, after this happened, after um, Sarah, Sarah helped God out and this baby Ishmael was born, um, Sarah, remember, she's the mistress of the household. She started, she started treating Hagar bad, you know, even though Hagar was wrong. So Sarah was wrong. She sinned for trying to help God out. Abram was wrong, so he sinned because he listened to Sarai instead of God. And then Hagar was wrong because she was being disrespectful to Sarai. Okay, then Sarai was wrong because she started treating Hagar wrong. She started treating him mean. And by culture, if someone's your surrogate, you're not supposed to treat them mean, but vice versa. The surrogate wasn't supposed to treat Sarai mean either. So all these people are in error. They're all doing wrong. And Sarah, but Sarah blames Abram. My wrong be on you, okay? And so it says, judge between you and me. So again, Sarah starts um, treating Hagar run, wrong and she runs out with the baby into the wilderness, okay? So when she goes out into the wilderness, and this is, I don't have this printed, but this is the other part. And she goes into one wilderness. Um, she goes and... Um, she hears the angel of the Lord speak to her. And the angel of the Lord says, um, you are now with child. Um, and so a matter of, you know, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Okay. But God basically told him. So, she was being treated wrong before she even had the child. So that's what happens. And she runs out into the wilderness. But then the angel of the Lord speaks to her and says, I'm going to give you a son. And he's going to be, um, um, I'm going to bless him as well. And so then God told her, you need to go back into, even though Sarah's been treating you wrong, you need to, Sarah's been treating you wrong. You need to go back. So she goes back and she has the child. Now, let's do a little timeline. So when Basically, when the promise was first made to Abram, he was 75 years old, okay, 75 years old. So you're going to have a child. He hadn't had any children, so um, he wasn't functioning, and Sarah didn't have any children. She was barren. So 10 years goes by. He's now 85, okay? After the 10 years, okay, Sarah says, take Hagar to be your wife, you know, go um, be intimate with her and bear a son so that the promise will be fulfilled. So he's 85. You know, we wait nine months. Nine months, we get Ishmael. So now Abraham's about 86 years old. Okay, so that's when um, Ishmael is born. So now, in the midst of this, so I'm jumping from chapter 16 to chapter 21, um, the beginning of chapter 21. But if you go on and you read, um, between this, between chapter 16 all the way to chapter um, 21, you'll see that God had to go back and tell Abram, and he had changed his name to Abraham, you know, he said, no, 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 Ishmael is not the son that is going to be the son of the promise. I told you that you were going to have a son, you know me, and even when Sarah heard it, she laughed, like, yeah, right, I'm going to have a baby, you know, at my age. So he said, you're going to have a son. You and Sarah are going to have a son and he will be the son of the promise. So that gets to Genesis chapter 21 verses one through eight. And I call this God keeps his promises, 25 years. Okay, everybody. So sometimes, you know, we say, I, heard, I hear a word from God and, and I'm the same way. We want it right now, right now, you know? And the catch is, you know, God's not a man that he's gonna, he's gonna lie. The promises of God are yes and amen. These are scriptures that I'm quoting parts of. The promises of God are yes and amen. If God said it, you know, we say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But really, if God said it, 
that settles it, whether we believe it or not. But God doesn't, okay, you have to look at God's time's not the same as ours. So we're looking for that microwave going to happen right now. Well, from the age of 75, it took 25 years before Isaac is born. So now Abraham's 100. Okay. So Abraham's 100. But God didn't break his word. Isaac is born. And he's the son of the promise. And this is from Genesis 1 through 8, right before our lesson starts. And the Lord visited Sarah as he has said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. So he opened her womb, okay? For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Isaac means laughter, or even he laughs. So in other words, God's laughing because God said, I got the last word on this. And I told you it was going to happen. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. You know, that's Jewish tradition, as God had commanded him. Now, Abram was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. Like, in other words, who would have thought that at my age I was going to have a baby? Okay, yeah, this is, yeah, this is some miraculous stuff up in here. This is a miracle. Makes you laugh like, what? Okay. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? You know, so remember, she not, she's not young. Okay. And so, for I have borne him a son in his old age. So Isaac is born. Everybody's excited. You know, they're about to have a feast and everything else celebrating the baby. Because remember, it's the circumcision and there's feasts and everything. So that's what's happening right before our lesson. So then we get to our lesson. And the first part I call flesh versus spirit, impatience versus promise, law versus grace. So you'll see why. So the child, we're talking about Isaac, the child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abram made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. So, you know, they like partying now. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, great feast. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham scoffing. Now, by this time, you know, you got to look at that timeline. Okay, remember that um, Abraham was um, 86. Okay, um, let me go back and make sure. Abraham was 85, 80, 86 when Ishmael was born. Okay, so if he was 86 when Ishmael was born, remember when Isaac was born, that, that's, a, that's another 14 years. So Ishmael was a teenager. Now, the other thing that they say is, um, we wean children now quickly, but even in the customs here, this child could have been older than like we, you know, I mean, we'd be like, this child could have been um, two or three or four years old um, as far as Isaac before they weaned them. Okay, they took a, they took their time weaning. Okay, so he could have been older. So it's the idea that Ishmael is somewhere between the age of probably not fourteen, but somewhere between the age of maybe fifteen and eighteen. He's a teenager. And you know, how are teenagers, everybody? So first of all, he's a teenager. He was acting like a teenager. But also he was used to being privileged. He was Abraham, you know, his father was um, uh, was powerful. He was a man of God. Um, he was the only child. He was the firstborn. So he was used to, you know, um, having run at a household in a sense. Then all of a sudden, here comes Isaac, this baby, the son of the promise. And all of a sudden, he's not the center of attention. And sometimes that happens even when people have another child, just because you have another child, and all of a sudden, the baby becomes the center of attention, and the other child feels um, slighted. But here, Ishmael starts um, scoffing. He starts treating his little brother. So again, could be a baby. Isaac could be a baby, but Isaac could have been two, three, or four years old. He starts treating Isaac wrong. And Sarah sees it. Therefore, she goes and she says to Abraham, Okay, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. Okay, so now she's upset because she's they're treating Isaac wrong, and she's like, she's got to go, and he, and that and that son of yours, that firstborn son of yours, got to go too, because he's not going to be heir. So it's true, Sarah was right. Ishmael was not set up to be the heir. He was not supposed to be heir or co-heir with Isaac. 
That was not God's plan. Remember, okay? Ishmael was basically a son of the flesh, okay? Because that's when they were helping God out and they ended up with a child, okay? The child of the spirit, okay, according to what God said was Isaac. This is going from my title. Ishmael was a son of impatience because Sarai did not wait on God and Abraham, Abram did not wait on God and so they brought Hagar into the picture and she had a baby. And so then Ishmael becomes the son of impatience because they didn't wait on God. And so we need to be careful that we need to wait on God. Isaac was the son of the promise. It took 25 years for that promise to happen, but God is not a man that he should lie. So the promise was gonna happen. We've got to trust God. Again, Ishmael is basically the son of the law. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. And Isaac represents grace, okay? God's unmerited favor, okay? Isaac's birth was miraculous, okay? That was a miracle that two um, people in their very, 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 very old age had a child. So it's not that Sarah is correct that Ishmael will not be heir or co-heir. OK, but the way she said it, cast her out because she, she didn't have any feelings for it. But you have to remember, she's asking Abraham to get rid of his son, to get his son out of the house, his teenage son. He's asking, I want that firstborn son of yours out of this household now. So it wasn't like now. So, you know, it's how she did it. OK, um, so now. What we need to realize, and this comes into the whole relationship between Ishmael and Isaac, and we see this in Galatians. So I have this for you. Okay, Galatians 4, 21 through 31. There are two covenants. And those words I gave you above that, that's part of that. So it says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bond woman, that would be Hagar. The other by a free woman, that would be Sarah. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gave birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Okay, now I'll stop there for a minute so we can um, get an understanding of that. And so from um, Dr. David Jeremiah's study Bible, um, one of the things he says when he's explaining this is he says, Hagar was a slave, so she symbolized bondage that comes from the law. Mount Sinai represents the birthplace of the law and the earthly Jerusalem is the home of those who are still under bondage. OK, because part of it is because they have not accepted the new covenant in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. OK, so that's what that whole verse of 24 and 25 was talking about. Then it goes into 26. But the Jerusalem above, that's the heavenly Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. So then Dr. David Jeremiah, he says, um, Jerusalem above is the place where Christ reigns. OK, Jerusalem that now is, OK, the one down here on earth, that's where Jesus was crucified. The Jerusalem above, that's where Christ reigns. The heavenly Jerusalem is the eternal center of freedom and the destiny and hope of all who are saved. Okay, so that's why it says, and it's the mother of us all. And then it says in verse 27, for, it's for it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. But basically is saying, we are children of promise as well, okay? We are children of promise because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because of his life, death, and resurrection, okay? And so we are children of the free woman. We are children of the promise when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord goes on a little bit further to say, now we brethren as Isaac was, our children of promise. Just like I said, we're children of promise, okay? But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. So even now, 
we get persecuted. We get treated wrong by people who are not saved, okay? Or even we just not say the enemy, um, Satan, he's gonna persecute us, okay? Because he knows that we're children of the promise. And just like Ishmael was persecuting Isaac or scoffing or mocking Isaac, we have people who scoff at us, who mock us, who treat us wrong because we believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So then verse 30 says, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bond woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. See, that goes back to what we just read in our lesson in Genesis. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bond woman, but of the free. And what that's saying is we are not of the law. We are of grace. We are in the dispensation of grace, God's unmerited favor. OK, so all that, even what happened in Genesis ties to what Paul is talking about in Galatians, OK, that we are because of accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we are children of the promise. OK, so all that we get back to our lesson. OK, so Sarah says, I want her out. I want her son out. OK, and she didn't get what happened to her. She's I want her out. Now, let's see what happens. Obey God is what I call the next section. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily he cared about, it doesn't say because of Hagar. You know, it wasn't like, hey, I, I need Hagar around a little bit more. No, it's because it's his son. It's his firstborn son. It's the first child he had, you know, the child that he had at the age of 86. And so, but God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Notice he's called a lad, so you can see he's a teenager. It doesn't say because of the baby, okay? Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. So God's saying, I know this is, um, I know this is hard for you. God's saying, I know it's hard for you. I know you love your son, but you need to listen to your wife, okay? And you need to go ahead and let, Hagar and Ishmael go because your seed is going to come through Isaac. What I promised you about being the father of many nations, the son of the promise is Isaac. And then in verse 13, it says, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bond woman because he is your seed. So God's saying, even though you tried to help me out, even though you have this son of the flesh, even though you have Ishmael and he's not the son of promise, I will make him a nation as well. Now, everyone, in case you need to know, um, Isaac, okay, the whole Jewish nation comes from out of Isaac. And then if you want to know, the whole um, Arab, Arabic nation comes from out of um, Ishmael. Okay, so Bedouin, or we can think of him. Okay, so here's the catch. Back in the day, Ishmael was mocking and, and fighting with his brother, caused, trying to cause issues with his brother, and still today. These brothers, these um, kinfolks are the brothers, okay? This family is still fighting, still fighting. God bless both. God said, I'm gonna bless Isaac because that is who I'm doing the promise through. But he said, but because Ishmael's your son, I'm gonna bless him and make him a nation too. And so the fight continues between the brothers. Now it says in verse 14, so Abraham rose early in the morning, okay? So he's going to obey God because God said, you need to go ahead and obey you, do what your wife wants you to do. So he rose early in the morning. First time he didn't obey God, remember, he went, he did what Sarah was supposed to do without asking God, okay, or breaking what God told him to do. I'm back to verse 15, 14 again. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread, so gave him some bread and a skin of water. So, you know, gave him some water or a jug of water, or whatever, or you can think of animal skin that they filled up, made into a pouch and filled it with water. And he put it on her shoulder and he gave it to her and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. So, okay, you gotta go. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now I have a map that I'm gonna show you. Okay, because remember, she had got thrown out before, you know, when she's pregnant, basically. She got thrown out because Hagar, Hagar decided to do this uh, setup. And this is the second time she got upset, okay? So on this map that you see, Okay, it, it's called the two flights of Hagar, okay, Ishmael. So you'll see that um, the flight when she was um, coming from Genesis 16, she ended up at um, 
um, Bill Hey I Roy, okay? And then the original, um, the, fl the flight where she was left the second time in Genesis 21, you notice up there where it says uh, Beersheba and Gerar up to the left, then the wilderness of Beersheba is right around it, okay? And so um, um, that actually stands for well of the, I believe it stands for well of the seven, the name. Okay, so this says both flights of Hagar ran south and east towards Shur and Paran to the Bir Lehei Roi spring. Okay, now she didn't know about the spring the second time when this first happened. But so she didn't end up going toward Egypt. She's Egyptian. She didn't go head out toward e Egypt. When she got thrown out, she ended up going into this wilderness. Okay, and she wasn't really in the direction of going to Egypt. Okay, and so. Um, and this is interesting because it says in Genesis 16, 12 and 21, 21, Ishmael will live east of his brothers in the wilderness of Paran. OK, so Egypt and Sinai are west of his brothers. OK, but because the word of God has said where they were going to end up when she left, remember, he just gave her the um, bread, gave her the water, said, got to go. OK, so her and Ishmael are out there. They don't end up going west they end up going east, okay? And they end up um, going south and they end up close to this spring. But that's a map so you can see on both of her flights, she ended up kind of going the same direction. First time, the angel said, go back and um, he to your, um, to your mistress, um, Sarah, and she had the baby. Then, you know, now it's like 14 plus years later and she's back out there, okay? Now let's see what happens. This is our lesson as well. So I call this the wilderness experience, okay? Because in our lives, we have a wilderness experience. Maybe anyone doesn't cast us out, um, but sometimes we go through a dry place. Sometimes we go through a dry place, um, whether that's um, spiritually, whether that's physically, if there's things going on, a hard time, um, a desert place. Um, and so here she's having this wilderness experience. So it says, and the water in the skin was used up, okay? So... There's no more water, okay? And she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. So she went a little ways away, but she said to herself, so she's talking to herself, you know, let me not see the death of the boy. So um, the water's out, you know, they're in a desert, okay? They're in a wilderness place. You know, they need water. If they don't get water, both of them are going to die. And she just says, I can't, I can't watch my son die. So I, I just going to go away from him. She put him under a bush, but she said, I can't watch him die. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and, and, and wept. She just started crying. Okay. So I have a visual of that. It's a little different than the story because, you know, trying to find a visual. So he's not kind of under a bush. He's under a tree on this picture, but she puts him under um, this bush. You know, you see the, the skin that's empty or the, the jug that's empty and she's crying. She's crying because remember, this is her only son, as far as we know. And now it looks like she, her son's going to die and she's going to die in the wilderness. And that's where we are. So she's crying. So again, Hagar is upset. Sarah didn't care. Get him out. Um, Abram cared because he cared about his son. But let's. But here's the point, God cares. And that's really my last point, but we're not on my last point yet. We're on my fourth point. And it says, he, God knows my name. And it's a song that um, we sing. And it's a song, um, it's sung by um, gospel artist, Tasha Cobb. And it goes, he knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. And oh, how he walks with me. And oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells me I am his own. And there's more to the song, but I call this He Knows My Name. Because in verse 17, it says, and God heard the voice of the lad. So I don't know whether he was crying or whether he was gasping because he didn't have any more water. Um, but it says, then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? He knows her name. And we need to realize God knows our name. When we're going through something, he knows who we are. 
He is our heavenly father. We sing a song, we are our heavenly father's children. We have to believe that, that God knows our name. Okay. Um, then he says, then it says, fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. He says, I've heard what's going on. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now, remember, we're in chapter 21. She's feeling like her son is going to die. But God had already promised her all the way back in Genesis 16 that I read to you that he was going to be, he, he had promised Hagar when she did that first flight that her son Ishmael was going to be the father of a nation. Okay. So back when, you know, so we're thinking all the way back when um, Abraham, Abram was Abram and he was 80, 85. God had made the promise then. It is now um, at least 25, but maybe 25 to 30 years later. And God is reminding, the angel of God is reminding Hagar, no, no, Ishmael's not going to die. I promised you, God promised you that he was going to make Ishmael a great nation. God's not going to break his word, everybody. He's not. And so then God opened her eyes. So after she had to remember what God said, we need to remember the promises of God. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. That's that name that we saw on the other page, okay? Uh, or right around that spring, but whatever, she saw a well. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And that's this picture I have. All of a sudden, now I'm sure that well might not have been that close to her, but, um, or she had to move the lad. But whatever she went, she filled the skin with water and she was able to give her son who was getting dehydrated and who was um, water, okay? Um, life-sustaining water. And we know that um, Jesus is living water and he's our life-sustaining water. Um, living water flowing over our soul. That's what we want, overflow. So even though Sarah didn't, have care, Sarah didn't care what happened to him, Abraham did care what happened to his son. He did obey God, but this is to show you that God keeps his word and also, even though there's injustice in this story, because that's what our, our theme is, there's injustice because Sarah's just like, I want to go. I just want to go. Even though there was injustice on how she was treated after she's the one that made Hagar have sex with her husband, Abram. You know, Hagar didn't say, oh, yeah, I want to go and um, um, be intimate with my master who's um, 86 years old, 85 years old. She didn't say that. She was a servant, a slave, a bond woman. She was, was required to obey her mistress and that's what she did, injustice. And then her mistress got mad. And again, Ishmael was wrong. He sinned, you know, scoffing at Isaac. But God still cared. And God still was going to keep his word. Okay, he's going to keep his word. So the last part of the lesson, I, I call it, God will take care of you. When we sing a song, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. So our lesson actually ends in verse 20, but I went ahead, the chapter ends in verse 21. And it says, so God was with the lad. God was with him. And he grew. And he dwelt in the wilderness. And he became an archer. So remember, I told you his name kind of means war, okay? But he became this mighty archer, you know, so. Um, and then he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. So he ended up staying in that wilderness. And his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Remember, they were Egyptian, you know, or his mother was Egyptian. She took a wife from the land of Egypt for him. And remember, from the beginning, what I told you was he was married. So his wife was Egyptian and he had 12 sons and one daughter. God blessed him. He made him a father of a nation as well, the Arabic nation. So then this comes, the last thing, just to close our lesson comes, this is an excerpt from our discovery lesson, okay, um, from page 32. And it says, very often when we are feeling isolated, hurt, or even victimized, 
it is difficult to remember that the God we serve is omniscient, which means all knowing everybody, omnipresent, which means he's everywhere, and omnipotent, which means he's all powerful. He knows everything that is going on in our lives. He knows when we are hurt and he knows who is hurting us. Our faith demands that we trust him to reconcile every situation in his appointed time, not in our time, in his time. God is everywhere all of the time. There is no situation that we endure alone. Just as a reminder, everybody remember Jesus' um, name from Matthew was Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, okay? And we also know the word says God will never leave us nor forsake us, okay? So again, this part says God is everywhere all of the time. There is no situation that we endure alone. Okay, he is available to comfort us if we ask him. God is all powerful. When present trials make us anxious or fearful, we must remember that the provision for all we need rests in his hands. We need to go to Philippians 4, where it says, Be anxious for nothing, but with everything by prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So we don't need to be anxious because all we need rests in his hands, okay? Then it says, Christians are not immune, everybody. Christians are not immune from tests, from trials and tribulations, okay? So if someone tells you, oh, get saved and you're not gonna have any um, tests or trials, they're lying to you, okay? Um, Christians are not immune from tests, trials, and tribulations. If anything, the enemy tries to attack us even more because he doesn't like that we now belong to God. He says, nor are Christian families immune from dysfunctions. And we just look back into our families and we know that, okay? And then it says, finally, through these hardships, we must hold on to the promise and the hope that only God can provide. Through these hardships, and we have hardships, okay? Um, this place is not our home, okay? This is a fallen world. We must hold on to the promise and the hope that only God can provide. So as sure as there is God, there is hope. And remember we sing that song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We must put our hope in God. We must trust God. We must obey God. We must believe God and we must realize that God will take care of us. God knows our name. He knew Hagar's name. He knew Ishmael's name. And he knows our name. The battle does not belong to us. The battles belong to God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise his name. This is our lesson for this Sunday. We give him praise in Jesus' name, amen.